Okay. Okay. We're glad everybody's here today, here in person and online. And today is September the 28th, 2021. And we'll prepare ourselves in our usual fashion by having a few moments of silent prayer, the option of naming privately to God the Father any unconfessed sins which ensures the filling of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that you are our rock. You never change, not even a shadow of changing with you. And you are our hope. You are our salvation. You are our everything. And we're so glad that you give us the opportunity to be here to feed on your word, to think about how wonderful you are in every way, and all the things that you have done for us and your admonition to us to not fear. And we're so thankful that we can have that stability and that confidence that we need so desperately through your word. So we pray that you will help us to focus and concentrate this evening. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a a few things I want to say before we get started. I thought maybe I will not do it, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, our country continues to decline at a shocking rate. Years ago, I said that if we ever have another draft, that women will, or girls will be drafted, and that came to pass. They voted for uh, females to register for the draft. And there were 130 Republicans that went along with the rest of the crowd and that's just is one indicator of how far we have fallen if i had a daughter that was of age and they tried to take her to put her in combat i'm not sure what i would do i would not be a handicapper but i don't i have a daughter but of course she's i've got three grandchildren now so that's not an issue but there will be a lot of fathers who are going to have to face that issue if indeed it comes to fruition. Also, they have made uniforms for pregnant ladies. Uh, I'm talking about combat uniforms. Now that says, uh, uh, again, uh, where we are, where you have pregnant women fighting in our wars. And there is an omnibus bill, you probably heard about it, that is 2,700 pages long. Where's my books here? I have some here. I had a stack of books. I don't know what. It... Anyway, I have a book that's about 600 pages. That's four times, more than four times that 600 page book. Yeah, that book there is about 600 pages. It's like you had four of those stacked on top of each other. Now, this is ludicrous that. The bills get that size, and the things in them are, would, is just an abomination. It's enough to simplify it. If this bill passed and it goes into effect, our country is gone. They say it's $3.5 trillion, but they say it's really closer to $5.5 trillion. Anyway, um, we need to keep praying for our country. And if it's God's will to take us down, then we need to pay, pray for endurance. It just so happens we're going to talk a lot about endurance this evening, right on target where we are with what's going on today. That's what I wanted to, uh, to say. So if you'll take your Bibles and open to Romans chapter 5 and verse 3. I'll put it on the board for you here. Of 
What's the matter, Cindy? Can you call Brett? It is do you have the cover off the lens? Is it, it looks like the cover you can see? Oh, okay. All right. Well, just do what you can. Okay. All right. Don't look at the woman behind the curtain. <laughs> okay, Romans chapter 5, verse 3. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. Doesn't seem like much of a verse as far as length or maybe what it has to say, but it does have a lot to say. And it should get everybody's attention when it says we exalt in our tribulations. We went over that before. The unbelievers would look at that and think this is nonsense because they have no spiritual uh, life. They don't have a human spirit. All they know is what they see. And they just roll their eyes and they think to themselves, this is the last thing that I would do in facing tribulations and adversities and turmoil in my life is to exult, which means to rejoice, to be glad about it. And so this is really written to believers, but not only to just believers, but believers who can connect the dots to recognize that God has a plan for each of us to where we can actually exalt and we can have joy even in the bad times, even in tribulations, catastrophes, you name it, we can exalt. That should get people's attention. Most people won't believe it, but if they knew what you knew or uh, any believer that is a student of the Word of God and connect the dots, they would be able to understand it. And that's where we're doing. We're starting out in verse 3, and it's going to go to verse 4 and 5, and it's dealing with the issue of tribulation. It's talking about trials. It's talking about testing. If there ever was a time that we need information on that, it's now, is it not? I think that God in His wisdom and in His grace put us here at this point now. It wasn't just a happenstance that we're getting into how we can exalt in testing because I think all of us would agree it looks like there's going to be tremendous testing in the not too distant future. That is unless Christ comes. And that will be major. Okay, so we say we exalt in our tribulation. And then remember the next word, how important it is? Knowing. Paul says this all the time. He said, know ye not that so-and-so, and the reason he's saying that, because he already taught him, and he said, don't you know this? Have you forgotten it? Did you not get it in the first place? Knowing is everything. I said, what you don't know can hurt you. In fact, it can kill you. Joy, is a, joy, joy in the midst of suffering is a theme that runs throughout the New Testament. And I gave you these verses once before. I'll give you to them just one more time. We're talking about joy in the midst of suffering. And it's not just mentioned once. It's mentioned many times. Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. Matthew chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. Acts 5, 41. Acts 14, 22, 2 Corinthians 12, 10, and 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 13 through 14. There's more, but that's enough to wet your whistle. I'm going to read this paragraph to you here. The believer's joy is not simply something they hope to experience in the future, 
but a present reality even in times of trials and distress. The joy is not a stoic determination to make the best out of a bad situation. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's more than that. Christian suffering, suffering is a source of joy because its purpose is to build character in the believer. And we're going to see that character is in a chain of events that has to be in place for us to be able to exalt in times of trouble. Character is huge. And then we looked at tribulations here. I'm still not where we're starting tonight. I'm just trying to bring us up to speed. We must be clear, we do not rejoice over tribulations. That would be mental illness or about tribulations, but in tribulations. As we're going through tribulations, one reason we can rejoice is because God is right there with us, leading us through this tribulation. Is it in God's power to avoid these tribulations so we won't have to suffer? Could he do that? Well, sure he could. But he doesn't. He wants us to experience the pain and suffering and the bewilderment of going through tests because it is at that time when we're going to depend on him, most likely, and he can demonstrate his power, his love, his faithfulness, and it's worth the pain and suffering. Let's see. Uh, I'll go down here. By the way, no one is born with the knowledge uh, that we need no one's born with this kind of knowledge that they can figure out on their own how that we can rejoice in times of trouble. It has to be learned. And What's the first thing that has to happen uh, before we learn is that we have to be humble. We have to be teachable. And that lives out probably about three quarters of the human race right there. Now that is up to us. And then if a believer is hungry for God's word and is teachable, God will supply the right pastor and the right church for him so that he can grow spiritually. And that God is responsible for. Our responsibility is to be humble and teachable. Of course, the other part is on God. Did you have your hand up, Katie? Did I see you raise your hand? Okay. Oh, <laughs> well, it's the Lord that needs to be, uh, is, gets all the glory and the thanks. I'm just the mouthpiece. But, uh, so we don't have to worry about, uh, well, we, we, we need to have the right pastor. We need to find the right church. Do you know that's not on us? I mean, we should have the momentum and the aspiration of finding a pastor that's right for us and a church that's right for us. How much power do we have in, in finding that? I mean, how, how do you go about that? Well, it, it, it doesn't even kick into gear until, first of all, you're humble and you're teachable and you get a taste of God's Word and you want more and you're not in a church or you're not... You, maybe you are in a church, but you're not getting any uh, training. You're not learning anything. Then God is going to direct you to the right place. That's on Him. And He's faithful to do it. So what I'm saying is that no one can stand at the judgment seat of Christ and say, well, you know, if I don't have the right pastor or the right church, but you, you just didn't, you, you fell down on your job because I didn't get the right one. The truth of the matter is most people who have been in a church for five or ten years or more and have friends there, it doesn't matter to them whether they're getting anything from the pulpit or not. They're entrenched. It's a country club. It's not a church. A church is a schoolroom. You don't go there to get your emotions titillated. You don't go there in order to uh, make new friends. Make new friends on your own time. Well, I... I 
you will make friends at church. I'm not saying you, that you don't. In fact, you're going to make the best friends you ever had because you all have camaraderie in wanting to learn and grow in the Word. There is a, an esprit de corps that believers have be, be, between each other because they are really brothers and sisters in the Lord and not just the fake thing. I used to go to a certain denomination and I thought, this is kind of weird. Everybody calls each other brother and sister at church and everywhere else they say, hey, John, yeah, what do you want, Bob? And you will know when you have the right pastor, teacher, and the right church because God led you there and your soul is content, it's satisfied, and you will be learning. That's how you'll know. Okay, here we go. This is today's lesson. So what is, what is it that believers should know? Because it said knowing. Tribulation brings about perseverance. That's what we need to know. Tribulation brings about perseverance. Now, brings about is the Greek word kat er godzomai. That's K-A-T-E-R-G-A-Z-O-M-A-I. It's a verb. It's a present mental indicative. That means tribulation continues to bring about perseverance. Middle voice means the subject produces the action of the verb. The indicative mood means it's reality, that it, this is what actually happens. And the definition of cat air gods am I is to cause a state or condition, bring about, produce, or create. Those are the different aspects of to bring about. And then we have the word perseverance. Perseverance is the Greek word hupomone, H-U-P-O-M-O-N-E, noun, nominative singular feminine. Nominative means it's the subject of the sentence. And it means the capacity to hold out or bear up under the face of difficulty. Patience, that's the way it's usually used more than any, I believe, is patience. Endurance, fortitude, steadfastness, or perseverance. All those terms have to do with perseverance. And it's something that comes about, is brought about. I have a few verses here that are actually sister verses to what we have in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 3. James chapter 1, verse 2 through 3 says, Consider it all joy. Now, consider it is an interesting word. It's an aorist tense, which means consider this in a point in time. Again, it is a middle voice, which means the subject produces the action. And it is a mandate. It is an imperative. It's a command. We are commanded to count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. So God isn't saying to believers, you can consider it all joy if you want to, or you can opt out if you want to. No, he said, do it. It's a command. But before you can execute that command, you have to know something, don't you? For God to command this to a baby believer is out of his league. He's talking to more mature believers than this. Consider it all joy, my brother, when you encounter various trials, verse 3, knowing. Wait a minute, isn't that what we just saw in Romans chapter 4, verse 3? Isn't that the same thing? Same thing, knowing again that the testing of your faith produces endurance. There's that word, hupomone. It means perseverance, fortitude, endurance, patience. And then we see in Romans chapter 15, verse 4, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. That through what? Perseverance. And the encouragement of the scriptures, those two go hand in hand. They are connected at the hip. That is, perseverance 
and encouragement. In order to persevere, you have to have encouragement. And our encouragement is in the Word of God. A lot of people say, I never get any encouragement. Well, you don't ever read your Bible. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction that through perseverance and the encouragement of scriptures we might have hope. I bet everyone here knows the Greek word for hope by now, elpis. But the word have, might have, is a verb, is a present active subjunctive. That means you keep on having this, you produce the action, but it's only a potential the, sub, the uh, subjunctive mood means that it might happen and it might not. Now let me ask you a question. When it says that through perseverance and the encouragement of scriptures, we might have hope. Who is he talking to? Who is it that must have hope? Huh? It's believers. All of us. And the reason it is in the subjunctive mood is for that little reason that God made us, which was our volition, our free will. God gave us free will, and we can use it to say, I don't want to necessarily rejoice in tribulation, and maybe I'll persevere, maybe I won't. But I don't want to do what it takes in order to be able to rejoice in tribulation. Now, who would ever say such a thing? People don't say that. But by their lack of interest in God's word and being a lazy butt believer, they're going to have to learn the hard way. That's why it's in the subjunctive mood. And the great majority of believers are in that subjunctive mood the kind that don't care about it. And I must say also, there's not many pastors that are teaching this, exegeting it through the Scripture, so it's very clear what God expects of them, and they can do this, but those who aren't hearing that and aren't going to do it, can't just blame it on that, because if you want to know it, God is going to provide the right pastor and the right church for you. There's nothing more fulfilling to him. I'm not trying to put words in his mouth, mouth, but that's the whole purpose for the church. That's the whole purpose for the angelic conflict. For believers in the church age to get to the right pastor, the right church, and start learning and growing, that glorifies God. So you can't blame God that, well, you never heard this because you didn't have the right pastor. If you were really interested, you'd have the right pastor. It is natural for people to think that they have bad luck or that maybe God is angry with them when they are persecuted or are abused by others. That's, that's normal. But the Scripture says that those who suffer for righteousness for the sake of Jesus Christ are blessed. And we're so busy trying to dodge trouble and problems that we miss out on the blessing. One, there's so many things that I, this sounds kind of trite, but there's so many things that I like about God. And this is one of them. I'll give you two instances. For one thing, he doesn't have us decide when we're going to die. And I'm always so thankful for that. I don't want that pressure. And here, when it comes to suffer for righteous for the sake of Jesus Christ are blessed, he doesn't make us do this, but it's there for our taking. Those who suffer for righteousness for the sake of Jesus Christ are blessed. But in your, in, let me put it, in our nature as being humans, none of us want to face persecution or abuse or tribulations, hardship. None of these things really are we're not going to 
rejoice about, are we? But in God's plan, he says, I can make it where you can rejoice. And here's the little secret behind that. You're going to suffer anyway. All of us are. We all are going to suffer. We have suffered. So why not, why not take advantage of what God offers here that you can suffer and rejoice in your suffering because God's going to bless you. Do you see how this ties in a little bit with Sunday when we're talking about uh, undeserved suffering? Undeserved suffering leads to what? Suffering by uh, Blessings by suffering. Suffering by blessing. Matthew 10, 12 says, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who when men cast insults at you and perse persecute you and all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Now look at the le next word. Rejoice. And this is a present active indicative, which means keep on rejoicing. Why would a person rejoice? It says, and be glad. Now, be glad is also a present tense. The middle voice means the subject, which would be us, are producing the action. Only this one is a command. Be glad. I think maybe parents could somehow introduce children into this for when they're, I'm not talking about punishment, but what I'm talking about is when things happen to children and they have to suffer also and it's not always deserved, the parents can teach them, now Johnny, I know you think this is not fair and it's not right, but this is part of the condition of life and you're learning now how to cope with these things and you don't have to cope with them by yourself. You can ask the Lord to help you. And he will help you go through whatever it is that is unpleasant for you. So how do we do that? Well, we pray to our Heavenly Father. And then the parent would pray with the little Johnny and explain how, so he could see how that is done. How valuable is that? How often is that done these days? These days, if poor little Johnny gets a dirty look from somebody, the Parents are going to take somebody to court. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they per persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see, anytime you're going to speak the truth, you can expect to catch some adversity. And now we're at the point to where we have what they're calling a a uh, cancel uh, culture, yeah, a cancel, uh, <laughs> it's hard for me to say, counter culture. And they just cancel you. If you, if you don't agree with them, they just cancel you. It's, it's madness. For your reward in heaven is great. So tribulation brings about perseverance. That's the point. This phrase specifically deals with the promises that we claim in the midst of problems and pressures that would otherwise cause us to succumb to mental attitude sins which makes us miserable. So do you want to feel miserable when you have suffering, suffering for blessing, or undeserved suffering? Or would you rather rejoice? That's where we're headed. By the time we get to this, finish this verse and the next two, we should look at Troubles and woes and tribulations in a, in a different light because there is a chain that happens and when that chain is in place, you can rejoice because of the blessings you're getting. Now, endurance under pressure proves that whatever is allowing you to endure works. You, are you catching that? Endurance under pressure, if you're enduring under pressure, it proves that whatever is allowing you to endure works. Otherwise, you wouldn't be enduring, right? 
So what is this endurance? Your endurance is the experiential proof that doctrine works. How do you know that doctrine works? Experientially. It's because when you have a problem, you have whatever it is you face, and we all, I bet if every one of us, if we did this exercise, you sit in a room by yourself and you start listing all the problems, all the aggravations, all the things that you have to deal with right now, not now in church, but in your life, I bet you'd be in there a while, wouldn't you? I would. I'm tempted to make my list right now. I can. I bet I can nearly beat anybody with my list. <laughs> I live in a 42-year-old house. So your endurance is the experiential proof that doctrine works. That is, it works if you have learned it because you were humble and you were encouraged by the Scriptures and that you have actually employed it. You are using it. We are on solid ground when we take a stand on Bible doctrine, which is always more powerful than our problems and our troubles. That is our escape. That's what encourages us, enables us, along with the Holy Spirit, to not let the world get us down. Again, we are on solid ground when we take a stand on Bible doctrine, which is always more powerful than our problems and troubles. We must fight the habit of letting problems take away our divine viewpoint and our stability and the joy with it. We have to fight that habit. Anybody want to hear? Raise your hand and say, I don't have that habit. I think divine viewpoint every time. I don't get into mental attitude sins. Well, bring your whole, your, your, um, halo up here, I'll polish it for you. This talks to all of us, doesn't it? We have to fight. It's not normal for us. What we want to do is do that, what this word which starts with a C. What do we want to do whenever this trouble hits? And it starts with a C. Huh? There you go. George, how'd you do it? <laughs> You're right. That's for all of us. You know, sometimes I think for myself, when something happens and uh, it's, and usually it's not something large, it's something small. But I have to take my mouth and cover it with my hands. Sometimes that's the only way I can stop the complaint from getting out. It's there. And most of the time, I don't even, I don't even slow it down. If you don't believe it, ask Gary. <laughs> and you could, you have the same thing, whether it's your husband or wife or children or brother or sister, whoever it is. That's our first inclination is to complain. And I think probably if every one of us really searched our heart inside, we can maybe put an adjective in front of that word complain, like chronic. Chronic complainer. Well, I better move on. <laughs> Turn your Bibles to Second Corinthians chapter four. Second Corinthians chapter four. And verse fourteen. Verse Corinthians four fourteen. Four fourteen. Second Corinthians. And notice the first word. <laughs> Do y'all see it? Would you underline it? Knowing. 
I'm not sure, but I think it's probably oida. There's more than one word for knowing, but I think here it's oida. So we start out with something that must be known. Knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will present us with you for all things are for your sake that the grace which is spreading to more and more people may cause the giving of thanks to abound to the glory of God. Verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, but, but through our outer, excuse me, though, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Teenagers don't get an idea of what this is about because they're not decaying on the outside. Well, they are. It just hasn't been that apparent yet. The law of second, uh, the the law of the second, dyna uh, what is it? The second, yeah, the second law of thermodynamics means we're all decaying. Gravity is going to take its toll. I don't need to say any more than that because we don't have any teenagers here anyway. But. Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. Does that mean you've got some super vitamins? Is that how it's renewed? They don't make a vitamin that renews the inside like it needs to be renewed. You all know what this means. Yeah. We are renewing our inside right now. This is how we do it. Somebody, some people really get down because each morning they see their self in the mirror and it looks more dreary every time. Of course, they have all kind of lotions and uh, creams and, you know, make them look good. But this is talking about something that must take place because you will not be able to rejoice in tribulations if you are not being renewed day by day on the inside by the word of God. Verse 17. For momentary, momentarily light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Now, this is, I remind you, Paul is writing this Notice he says, for momentary light affliction is producing for us. He is including himself in this so-called momentary light affliction. Like being beat with a whip, 40 lashes. Being bobbing around in a Mediterranean sea overnight. Being spat at, beat, cursed. You name it. That for him, he calls light affliction. What does that make ours look like? Feather afflictions? But it's producing for us an eternal what? Wait, wait. These little things that are happening to us when we are trusting the Lord to get us through it, when we apply these doctrines and use his promises to lift us up in encouragement, when those things happen, they result in eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. I don't know what the hardest thing you ever faced was, but whatever it was, when you get to heaven and you have been faithful and trusted in the Lord to get you through these things, and you're going to see the reward you're going to get, you're going to be amazed. I get this is what was waiting for me for that little old thing that I had to endure on earth? That's what he's saying here. Eternal, I'm comparing a light affliction with eternal weight of glory. Far beyond comparison. 
And then verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen. Now think about that a minute. We look not at things which are seen. How do you, well, physically, I guess you could do that by just shutting your eyes. But that's not what it's talking about. Listen to what, what, what he says. But the things which are not seen, the invisible things, for these things which are seen are temporary, temporary, temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What's an illustration of something you don't see? How about your inner man being renewed day by day? And I want you to underline day by day. You can't coast in the spiritual realm. You can't go to Bible class and do your own reading, and even when you're not at church, you're going over notes, you're reading your Bible, you're studying. Day by day. Now, if you did everything you were supposed to and you did it for a full month, and man, I mean, you were pumped. You were a spiritual, um, what do they call those guys that are in the suits and they do, well, I can't even think of the name of them. Ninja, ninja. You're a ninja Christian. I mean, you're pumped. You did everything and you did it for a month. So, then you thought, okay, well, I've got this down. I, I think I'm going to just coast for a while. Maybe next month I might le read the Bible again. Does it, does it work that way? How often do you need encouragement? How often do you need doctrine? I, I, I talk to people, oh, yes, I already know that. I'll, I'll explain something or tell somebody that. Oh, I already know that. Oh, yeah? By the way you're talking, I doubt you've seen it in months or years. They don't See, people don't recognize they give things away by the way they say things. I'm excited about a verse. I'm, I just saw something. I saw a new nuance to it, and I tell somebody, oh, well, yeah, I've heard that. You reckon they're getting... What this says here, their inner man uh, is renewed day by day. I think not. I think that, oh, really? What is it? I need to see that. That's something I need to see. Now, have I heard that? Don't tell me something I already heard. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking. You, you talk to the same people. Well, not the same people, the same type of people. So the things that are not seen are eternal. And everybody on earth are working for what? Things that are seen. And this, is to, this verse is to be taken literal. For everything that we see, everything that we see is temporal. Because the Lord is going to burn it up. And he's going to make a new heavens and a new earth. And the only thing that is going to last from this realm we're in now are the things that are invisible. Invisible, like our love towards the Lord, our positive volition, our hunger, our trust, our adoration, all these things are invisible. In the English language, we're fortunate that we have words to express these. In the Greek language, they didn't have that. And so when they were talking about things that we would say maybe are psychological or emotional, they would use parts, uh, the integral parts of the body for emotions, for example. So I would say this very much goes along with what we saw in Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Oh, well, we're not there yet. We're right above it. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Let's read it first. This is Romans 4 through 5. Now remember, adversity produces what? Endurance. So verse five, uh, 4 and 5 says, And perseverance, 
which you already have. Produces, it doesn't say produces, but it's left out. That's what it means there. And perseverance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint. Of course, hope here, you understand, is confident expectation. And whenever you have confident expectation in the Lord or His Word, this is a promise, you will never be disappointed. It's impossible for God to disappoint someone who puts their trust in Him. Because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Now, it's going to take a little while to get through this verse. We don't have much time left, but we'll give it, give it a shot to start with. So it says, and perseverance we have proven character. Proven character is the Greek word... Uh, Dokime, that is D-O-K-I-M-E. That's an eta, which sounds like an A. It's a noun accused of singular feminine. And this is the definition. The experience of going through a test with special reference to the result, standing a test, that means standing firm in a test, and building character. You cannot be a servant of God. You cannot grow to spiritual maturity. You cannot pass tests that God allows to come our way without having character. But this Greek word means proven character. It's meaning you have character that has been tested. And you pass the test. That's what this word proven character means. Dokimai. So the Greek word simply means proof. It was used of testing metals to determine their purity. It represents the proof of Christian character and those who glory in tribulations because of what those troubles produce. This is the whole thing. Are you starting to get it? Troubles produce something. All these things, endurance, character, hope, all these things start with what? Adversity. Adversity produces endurance, endurance, proven character, proven character, hope. And then hope will never be disappointed. You'll never be disappointed by putting your faith in God's promises. It's impossible. Here is a quote from Robert H. Mounts, Romans, volume 27, in the New American Commentary. This is what Mr. Mount says. He's also, uh, I don't have my books. I always have my books around, and when I need them, they're not here. You have your book? Yeah, hold that up. This is uh, what, we're, what we're going over for uh, Scott here. That's the Greek grammar, and it's by the same guy who made this paragraph, Mounts. Here's what he says. Endurance brings proof that we have stood the test. Thus, it is the experience of coming through a time of testing that produces hope. Our confidence in God's ability and willingness to bring us through difficult times lead to an ever brighter hope for that which lies beyond. We're talking about critical things. People who cannot endure are weak people. Wouldn't you agree to that? They're missing something. But what are they missing? Character. Because if you have character, you're willing to endure suffering because of the cause. You have an honorable cause there. Our confidence in God's ability and willingness to bring us through difficult times. Let's just think about that for a moment. Our confidence in God's ability and willingness to bring us through difficult times. Do 
Do you see the word willingness there? If we are willing for him to bring us through difficult times, it must mean that there are some who are unwilling, aren't they? What do people who are unwilling to bring, bring them through difficult times, for God to bring them through difficult times, why, what do you think makes them unwilling to do it? Could it be that they have no knowledge? Could it be that they don't know that God would do that? Do, could it be that they don't know the promises that you will never be ashamed by putting your trust in God, taking your problems and putting them on Him? You claim a promise. Maybe they're not willing because they don't even know that this exists. They don't know that you can go through difficult times and not be undone. That you can be calm. That you can be content. You can even rejoice. And one reason you're rejoicing is because you know that God's got your back. He's seeing you through it. How do you know? Because He promised that He would. And so many people are afraid to pull the trigger on that. To actually step out in faith and trust Him. They'd rather complain. They'd rather make arguments. I mean, just He said the help us expectation helps us to know that we're going to make it through. Well, look, look where I'm going next here. Willingness to bring us through difficult times what does it do? Leads us to an even brighter hope. That means a more, more confidence in Him. The more you put confidence in the Lord, the more you're going to have stability. But what happens so many times is we start out and we have a, our goal is to trust the Lord to see, it, see us through some, whatever we're going through. And things get worse and we start getting wobbly. We start getting shaking. They say, oh, i got to do something. And somebody says, yeah, you got to do something. And so you go out and you take the problem on yourself and it winds up a fiasco. Yeah. Brighter hope. Who, who in this world does not want a brighter hope? Hmm? And how many people out there have no hope? Just look at the suicide rate. Look at the drugs that they take and all the things and the, the uh, alcohol they drink. Out in my barn, I have a, a radio and the only, the only station I can get is Brenham's. And they play that country music now, I love country music, but what they're singing, well, I don't even know what they're singing. But you'll see I'm getting to a point here in a moment. Um, it sounds like the country music they have now is just rap, just kind of made, just singing a little bit, though. It's, it's, it, I detest the whole thing of it. I'll give you an example of what it sounds like. Uh, there is one song, let's see, what's the name of Oh, yeah. I need some whiskey glasses. That's the name of the song. And whiskey glasses, don't, you know, not these glasses, but the kind you pour. And one of the lines in it is, uh, his girlfriend's gone away. So he, he says, that this line is, uh, set them up, set them up, set them up, uh, pour it out, pour it out, pour it out, knock them back, knock them back, knock them back, because you're not coming back again. Does not have, isn't that something what people would do when they have no hope? Huh? Oh boy, we can, we can instill hope in people. God gives us that opportunity. And we don't have to teach them. We can just live our life to where they can see it. If people aren't seeing the hope 
the confidence in God and His Word in your life, then you're failing. Even in hard times, that's when it really shines. So I'm going to have to end here, but uh, we're going to have another one or two verses. And by the time we get through with those two verses, I hope that for all of us, we can look at all of the disaster that is coming our way and not even flinch because we are being renewed day by day. And those who are being renewed day by day, the devil, the world, and the flesh can't touch them because they are maybe obsessed with the living word and the written word. Let's close. Heavenly Father, we see who you are through your scriptures. Full of love. Imploring us to trust you. To go through these hard times with our eye on you. That is when life is most real. That's when we trust you the most. That's when we go day by day and we want to see more promises. We want to see more about you because how phenomenal and wonderful wonderful and fantastic you are and what you want for us. And when we're focusing on those things, we forget. What, what was that problem I had? You've given us the Holy Spirit to help, to guide us, to give us wisdom and discernment and hope. So we thank you for these things and help us to think about them. Draw conclusions in our soul for what we've got so far. And we look forward to the next few verses that can literally change our attitude towards suffering. We thank you for this. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.